In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Where were you 20 years ago? September 11th, 20 years ago, where were you? If you are over the age of, say, about 25, you probably know right away the answer to that question. I was in my very first class, in my very first year of seminary, Old Testament, and our Old Testament professor ground the class to a halt and led us in prayer as the news started to trickle in about what was happening in New York City. My husband, who was not my husband at the time, he was a guy I had just met in second year seminary. He was on his way into Toronto from St. Catharines on the bus and was wondering why there was this mass exodus of people on the highway trying to hightail it out of a big city as fast as they possibly could. I've heard all kinds of stories shared in the last couple of days, even in the last couple of weeks. People know who they were with, where they were, what the circumstances were, and what the feelings were when they first heard the news, and especially when they first saw the footage of those airplanes going into the Twin Towers. What about September 12th? What about 20 years ago today? Do you know where you were 20 years ago today? Do you know where you were 20 years ago, September 10th? Do you know the before and after of September 11th? You might have some pretty distinct memories of the before and after as well, because it was one of those events that seemed to split time in half, what the world was like before and what the world was like afterwards. There are some things that have been pretty different in our world since September 11th. You go to an airport and security is nothing like it was on September 10th, 2001. The border between Canada and the US is pretty different as well. Two wars were waged, Iraq and Afghanistan, in the name of what happened on September 11th. And so we know that there is this huge legacy of violence and destruction, division that has continued all across our world over the past 20 years, and the ripple effects of all of that is still so very present with us and affecting us in our world today. There's another legacy, there's another after from September 11th. There was a noticeable bump in church attendance right after September 11th. People wanted to be together. They wanted to connect with meaning, with truth. They wanted to join in prayer and look for God's guidance and love in their lives. The presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church in the US, Michael Curry, also known for preaching at the wedding of Harry and Meghan, He offered a brief online reflection this past week in remembrance of the 20th anniversary of 9-11. He said this, while 20 years have passed, I want us to pause and remember the days that followed those tragic events. There was a moment in the aftermath when people came together. We were praying, grieving, and also working together. Because in that moment, however fleeting it was, we knew with immediacy and vulnerability that we need God and we need each other. A fleeting moment where we understood that we need God and we need each other. I want to use that insight of need as a lens for looking at today's gospel passage and looking for how God is speaking a word of good news into our remembrance and into our lives here and now. 
I think it's fair to say that this is one of the more combative interactions between Jesus and his disciples. Jesus lets the cat out of the bag and tells them where all of this is headed and it doesn't sound like it's anywhere good. This is headed to the cross, to suffering, humiliation, and death. And all of the listeners would have been shocked by that, but Peter's the one who speaks up, as Peter is wont to do. Peter speaks up, and we might translate Peter's words to Jesus as a little bit stronger than just rebuking Jesus. Peter tells Jesus to shut up. He's so shocked by what Jesus has to say because nobody is looking for a Messiah who's going to make their lives worse. They're looking for a Messiah who's going to make their lives better. And here Jesus is announcing that he is headed toward the worst form of torture and horror that the Roman government has come up with in order to keep people submissive and fearful. What kind of good news is that? Jesus escalates the combat by responding to Peter by telling Peter to shut up. And going one step further and saying, get behind me, Satan. He hears in Peter's words the power of evil. And then Jesus really throws down the gauntlet. Because Jesus makes it clear that it's not just Jesus who's headed to the cross. All of us are to take up our cross to follow Jesus. There is no way of gaining our lives without being willing to lay our lives on the line. It's really hard in that moment. It's hard today to hear how suffering and death and humiliation and the cross could be gospel, could be good news. But I want to go back to how this passage starts, because it starts with a confession of faith. Again, Peter is jumping in, the first one to speak up when Jesus says, who do people say that I am? Peter names it. He names the truth. You're the Messiah. He's the first of the disciples to confess that Jesus is the Messiah. Now, this is connected to another time that we hear Peter speaking up, jumping into the fray and speaking up. And if you've been following along, participating in our worship over the last couple of weeks, you might remember this passage because it came up just a couple of weeks ago. It was another point in time when Jesus was alarming the people around him. Jesus had said, I am the bread of life. And people were horrified by him saying that. They thought it was heresy because they heard in those words that Jesus was aligning himself with God's own life. And most of the followers of Jesus who had been hanging on his every word left left in shock and scandal. And there were only a couple of disciples left, including Peter. And Jesus turned and said to those disciples, are you going to leave too? And it was Peter who spoke up and said, we have nowhere else to go. You have the words of eternal life. In that moment, Peter didn't say that he understood Jesus, that he agreed with Jesus, but he did identify that he needed Jesus, that we need Jesus. We need the way of Jesus. That is the path of life. And it's that need that helps us unlock the good news in this passage today. Because that need is connected to the truth. 
As Bishop Michael Curry said, there's that fleeting moment where we know that we need God and we need one another. The truth is that we can't live just for ourselves. The truth is that we don't walk this road alone. God is with us. The truth is that we're not merely a collection of individuals. We are relationships. And the truth is that we can only give up our lives in the understanding that our lives were never just our own anyway. That our lives have always belonged to God, always do belong to God, and always are held in the hands of our loving God. This is the need and this is the truth. We are created to know and be known, to seek and serve and love God. And there's no way of doing that apart from figuring out how to love one another. That's the truth and that is the need of our lives. The suffering is real too. Death is real too. The cross is real. All of us have our crosses. All of us have our crosses to bear. That's part of what it is to be a human being. Human beings who make mistakes, who don't live forever, and who know just how fragile we really are. Suffering is part of it. And in the midst of that suffering, we can align every fiber of our being with this need and with this truth. To align our lives in relationship with God and to give everything that we do, everything that we are, everything that we have in order to serve that relationship of love with each other. And there is no real life apart from that need and apart from that truth. September 11th, split time down the middle to before and after. And our world has been different in some pretty awful ways since September 11th. In the ways of war and in the ways of violence, our world has been different. And there was also a legacy of love. I've been seeing a lot of tributes on social media to the emergency responders, the first responders, who were there on the scene without a thought for their own lives, who were there on the scene when the towers were collapsing, when the world was collapsing, and they were willing to run into those collapsing towers in witness to that truth that we don't live for ourselves and that when push comes to shove, we can lay everything on the line in loving care and self-sacrifice for the sake of others. 412 emergency workers and first responders lost their lives in September 11th attacks. And their legacy of love and truth is part of our remembrance 20 years later. It's a reminder to us of, as Bishop Curry said, that fleeting moment when we knew with immediacy and vulnerability that we need God and we need each other. If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. Amen.